so um, colleagues that are um, in the meeting and also those that uh, are watching on YouTube, um, we're going to wait for just a couple of minutes uh, to redirect more people from the old, old uh, webinar link to YouTube to watch. Um, so I would suggest, Sarah, uh, with your agreement to wait for two to three more minutes. Uh, the the um, um, watching count on YouTube is climbing. Yeah, no problem from my side, Tina. Just let me know. Great, thank you. And uh, thanks, everyone, for uh, being flexible and... Uh, joining uh, uh, uh changing the logistics a little bit and joining us on youtube to to, to listen And just to show everyone that we're live, I've just changed the start to 10 past the hour. <laughs> and I hope um, uh, we pick up more colleagues on, on YouTube. Great, we have everyone except one uh, presenter, the colleague from Sabin. Um, and I think uh, also the uh, Pierluigi Sacco. Let's wait for a couple of more minutes. Uh, sorry everyone for the inconvenience and the late start. Uh, thank you for flexibility and watching us on YouTube.
Okay, so while uh, our colleague Tim, Tim is trying to uh, redirect people from um, the other webinar link, uh, this is uh, where the um, webinar and the presentation of the uh, outcomes of the WHO Infodemiology Conference will take place. Um, so while our colleague is still trying to redirect some people, I think we are uh, ready to start in a minute. Uh, and I will hand over to our colleague uh, Sarah Hess at WHO Geneva, who will um, facilitate us uh, uh, through uh, the event. Sarah, I'll be ready in like 30 seconds with the video. No problem, Tina, thank you. And uh, thank you to everybody who's joined. Apologies for the technical difficulties that uh, we encountered with Zoom. Um, my name is Sarah Hess and I work for the WHO Information Network for Epidemics here at headquarters in Geneva. I'd really like to welcome you to this webinar. From the end of June until today, uh, WHO has convened and been hosting virtually the first ever infodemiology conference. And this conference has been organized by a large team of over 40 people um, in different roles from all three levels of WHO, country offices, regional offices and headquarters, as well as from um, a large number of external partners and colleagues at the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. On this webinar, we are going to hear about the experiences and the outcomes of this conference. Um, and so without any further ado, I would like to hand over to Tina. We are going to start with a short video um, where a participant is going to be sharing some reflections on the conference. Tina, over to you. Great. Uh, here we go. And it has been great to uh, a great opportunity for me to be able to share thoughts, ideas, and collaborate with peers from different academic disciplines uh, or, or, or fields, and also with uh, practitioners on how to better understand the current information environment, the flows of misinformation and disinformation, how to better um, prevent uh, and respond to uh, infodemics. And, and, to, and how to measure the, the effects of uh, the exposure of misinformation and disinformation by individuals. There are similarities and dissimilarities between the spreading of a disease and the spreading of information. The most relevant one being uh, that information travels much faster than a biological virus. One of the most interesting things I heard about was the use of personas in the development of targeted communication materials. This really gets to the critical role of identity in this issue. I enjoy participating in the sprints and learning about how others from so many different fields have approached infodemic problems. So we've been working on NLP and machine learning for understanding social issues, um, but being able to learn uh, about the need and social value of this for misinformation in the area of health has been eye-opening for me. About not only what information is communicated to different audiences, but how it is translated and then received and the real importance of understanding um, different communities' perceptions of what is valuable. It was a topic too, when uh, Anis Aslan and uh, Masato Kajimoto provided uh, their um, lessons on information environment. We have used uh, this interactive uh, online mind mapping tool to together create a visual graphic of um, how uh, misinformation can be addressed, where misinformation uh, originates, uh, how can we deal with it, how can we police it, how it can be corrected, and also what role uh, social media plays. It's and clear that some practices and methodologies are transferable. It's clear that we can share these methodologies, but it's also clear that we are moving towards looking at ways that we can intervene to protect global populations. So I'm happy to make connections with uh, people from many disciplines, and I think uh, solving a complex problem like misinformation would require a global effort, a coordinated effort. And I think this uh, first World Health Organization was a very good step 
towards this goal. I think that uh, it's extremely important, especially for these new challenging uh, visions, to have uh, a test like this. Because what happens today is that it, despite of all the resources that we have, there is not enough diversity in our discussions. And that was absolutely a crucial step forward. Turns out I'm not just meeting with people who are smart and intelligent. They are also have big hearts. And I think that is the most important thing. When we discuss each other, compliment each other, embracing each other, uh, I became realized that working in this field, we need diverse uh, perspective and also we need collaboration more and more. So we need a coordinated response to fight misinformation and establish a community of practice which facilitates sharing of best practices and also coordinate our response. Thank you very much, Tina, for sharing that video. I think we can see from the very global um, range of participants who took part in the conference that uh, the concept and the problem of infodemics is truly a, gro a global problem. Um, I'd now like to hand over to uh, Margot Mattis, who is a technical officer here in WHO HQ in the Department of Global Infectious Hazards Preparedness. Margot was a part of the conference organizing team and supported the topic facilitators. Margot's going to talk a little bit about the structure of the conference, how it worked and uh, how people participated. Margot, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. Hello, everyone. So yes, my name is uh, Margot Mathis and uh, I'm part of the co-organizing team of, uh, of this event. And in this closing day of the first Global Infodemiology Conference, I would like to give some reflection about the organization of the conference and what we collectively achieved. First of all, I, I really would like to warmly thank uh, the co-organizing team. So Sylvie, Tim, Tina, Liz and Stefano. But to put together this big event, um, as Sarah mentioned, we really relied on an expanded organizing team. So I would like also to thank the fellows at uh, USCDC, the EpiWin team in WHO, and I'm sure I'm missing many people, but thank you to everyone who, who contributed. The conference has been organized in less than a month, and it was a great collaborative uh, effort between WHO and partners to ensure that everything was ready to allow fruitful discussions. Uh, to prepare all background documents and to ensure that the conference ran smoothly. We had two fantastic chairs, Neville and Diroj, uh, as well as a total of 10 amazing keynote speakers uh, during the pre-conference and the closed scientific conference. We had uh, eight great topic masters, eight uh, very motivated and dedicated topic assistants, as well as four amazing coaches. So just to give you an idea of the scope of the preparatory work that was needed um, to organize this conference, just for the close scientific conference, we had more than 49 organizers and speakers involved. So it was really a, a big machinery to make this happen. I would also like to thank all the participants for their time and their involvement in the conference. We know it's not easy to dedicate many hours of your time during busy crisis uh, period, and especially uh, at short notice. I think this really demonstrates um, that there is a great interest currently in this field and that we need to build on this momentum to advance the science and to be better equipped to tackle infodemics. So the format of the conference was quite original and successful. We had a pre-conference um, open to the public with seven amazing keynotes that really set the scene. We had more than um, 11,000 people connected online uh, from various regions in the world. We had people coming uh, from academia, from the healthcare sector, uh, from international organizations, from public health authorities, from NGOs, from the private sectors, from civil society, as well as from the media. So very uh, diverse expertise represented. Then we had the closed scientific conference that gathered more than uh, 110 experts around the world. We had 20 disciplines uh, represented across 19 time zones. So it was quite a nightmare for the um, organizing team to schedule all the meeting, but we had a very dedicated expert who joined us uh, for the discussion even during night hours. We had an opening day with keynote speeches, and then we had an intensive, intensive closed working session uh, called the sprints. 
uh, and experts were grouped, grouped in four teams and they were discussing four topics over two weeks. We had a total of 16 sprints uh, for a total of 32 hours. And if you combine the work of all the ex experts who participated, it represents about 3,000 hours of work. So it's quite amazing. And the sprints discussion were brilliantly uh, driven by our topic masters. So around four topics. The first one was how can the digital physical information environment be measured and monitored? The second one, how does the information originate and spread? Third one, how does information affect and impact individuals and population? And the last one, what intervention work to protect and mitigate? So about 86% of the participants say that they think WHO should run conferences similarly in the future. Uh, and I tend to agree. I think it was a really uh, productive way to conduct meeting. The sprints lasted for two hours twice a week and people were very engaged in the discussion. Uh, probably more if they were in a meeting uh, all day. They had time to, uh, between the sprint, to look at the background documents and to prepare for the discussion. And we also had uh, electronic tools that enabled us to conduct surveys and to share uh, experience and research work in real time. So it was a really, really interactive meeting, probably more, much more than traditional ones. I just would like to, to highlight a few outcomes of this uh, conference. So first, we are really defining together the field of infodemiology, the science behind managing infodemics. So this starts with defining and agreeing on a common vocabulary. And here my colleague Stefano will talk more about the glossary in a few minutes. We are also building a community of practice and a community of research together. And I was a topic assistant during the conference and it was really great to see people from the very different fields coming together to work on some topics trying to understand one another and sharing their knowledge and experience. Many participants reported that they made connection with other participants outside of the meeting. So there was and there is still a great appetite in continuing this enriching collaboration in the future. And my colleague Liz from US CDC will talk more about how we will continue to collaborate on this in the future. We also have started to build a public health research agenda to direct focus and investment in this emerging scientific field. It is articulated around five stream. So how to measure and monitor the impact of infodemics during health emergencies, how to detect and understand the spread and impact of infodemics, how to respond and deploy information that protects and mitigates the infodemic and its harmful effects, how to evaluate infodemic intervention and strengthen the resilience of individuals and communities to infodemics, how to promote the development, adaptation, and application of tools for the management of infodemics. And here, again, my colleague Liz will talk more about uh, the research agenda. So lastly, I would just like to mention that we have a lot of material published on the WHO website about um, this conference, about infodemiology, and about infodemic management. We have videos, we have the booklet of the conference, and we have some drawings and soon the report of this conference will also be available. So I'm sure we have shared with you the, the link or it will be shared very shortly. So thank you again to all and over to you, Sarah. Thank you very much, um, Margot. I think uh, a huge congratulations to the organizing team for not only uh, leading in a new subject area, but also leading in a new way of virtually organizing global meetings. It seems like it was a, a huge success I'd now like to uh, pass to uh, Brian Yao. Brian Yao is also a colleague at WHO here at headquarters. He works in the vaccine safety team. However, Brian has a background in product design, um, working for 10 years um, in the commercial sector, helping organizations achieve recognition and growth. Um, Brian was a part, also a part of the conference organizing team um, as one of the technical staff and he's going to share some experience uh, from the coach's uh, perspective. Over to you, Brian. Thank you, Sarah. It's been a, an absolute pleasure to, to be involved in, uh, in the conference. And uh, it's actually been handed to me on a plate because the organizing committee have dotted every I and crossed every T. It was, uh, it was fantastic. Uh, the, the title of coach actually inevitably brought my um, competitive instincts out. 
and I really wanted to get everyone engaged and enthusiastic. Um, but it wasn't necessary because everyone was already engaged and they all recognized the epidemic as a, as a global problem. Uh, so just some, uh, I just want to relay some of, of some of the team trends uh, because I'm speaking on behalf of um, uh, the three other coaches. Uh, so from, from my team, uh, the team members were, were united and supportive of each other's viewpoints throughout the sprints. And uh, each discussion was enhanced by the different perspectives as the sprints advanced, there was an increasing appetite uh, to expand the field to include other disciplines as well. Uh, so, um, you know, this is this is the start, uh, the first epidemiology uh, conference, and I think you know everybody is prepared and really wants uh, to continue with this. And so, uh, the yellow team coach, which uh, was uh, Nitu Abad from the U.S. Centers of, uh, for Disease and Control and Prevention, uh, remarks that from this first sprint onwards. Participants found ways to leverage their diverse backgrounds to speak a common language, often using specific examples from their work. E.g., a historian used the history of HIV messaging to explain how COVID-19 messaging can avoid making similar mistakes earlier in the pandemic. And uh, blue team coach, uh, Daniel Hugum Dobler uh, from the WHO. As the discussions progressed, uh, blue team showed a trend towards more meaningful dialogue building on and responding to comments made by other team members. As a result, the outcomes of the discussions became clearer and reflected greater consensus. And finally, uh, red team coach uh, Tom Trowinard, uh, also from uh, the WHO, uh, the team shared a wealth of experience uh, approaching this topic from their relative disciplines and shared the benefits and challenges they had encountered. Many shared, some unique. The team did a great job highlighting and engaging with the challenge of balancing scalability and local context. And, and again, I just wanted to not only thank the organizing team, but um, also all the participants um, from their diverse backgrounds. Uh, they all came together and recognized uh, the importance of, of the subject. And uh, it was just really great to, to be part of. So uh, thank you very much. That's uh, just my um, brief take on the conference. Thank you so much, Brian. And I just want to highlight the fact that if you are new um, to this area of work and you want to know a little bit more about how the conference uh, was organized, there is a conference booklet on our website that kind of lays out how it was organized and has the kind of agenda so you get a better feel for um, how it actually worked. Um, I'd now like to hand over to another colleague from WHO, Stefano Brezzo. Stefano um, is a consultant who is supporting our infodemic management pillar of the COVID-19 uh, response. He's uh, busy when he's uh, not uh, working on infodemiology, completing his PhD in political science and international relations at the University of British Columbia. Um, Stefano, of course, was also part of the conference organizing team, and he was supporting the development of the glossary. Stefano, over to you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I'm Stefano, and I also was part of the group that worked on the glossary. You should, sh you should see the slide soon. The, uh, and I would like to give you a brief overview of uh, where we're at. What you see in the, in the slide here are some words from the glossary, as it was towards the end of the conference. Now, this is not fancy, but in the main, uh, it seems to me to give a fair idea of uh, what were some of the key terms uh, discussed. You'll see uh, information, social networks, but also uh, data and uh, literacy. Uh, next, as a reminder of the main purpose of the glossary, I would, like, uh, I would like to remind you that basically it was twofold. So the first purpose was to provide a common understanding of terms that are related to epidemiology especially as these terms often have their roots in several disciplines, and also to provide a place during the conference that was dedicated to the discussion of terminology. If you look at the left of the circle there, uh, it will give you an idea that we included 80 terms, 80 initial terms at the beginning, and over 50 new terms were included during the conference. Also during the conference, additional 100 terms uh, were uh, indicated as to be of particular interest to the epidemiology discussion. That brings the total number of terms in the glossary at over 230. But this number by itself doesn't give you an idea of three crucial aspects of the work. The first one is that many terms connected were connected to other terms during the conference. 
sort of uh, mapping out what is relevant to what across several disciplines. Also, uh, terms in the glossary now have multiple meanings, reflecting multiple uses. Uh, think about word like diffusion. Uh, it may refer to different things, whether we are talking about physics or in our social media. And what came up was that we're going to have to be clearer about using these terms in context. The number by itself also doesn't give you an idea of the interdisciplinarity of the conference, including uh, 15 and more fields and the breadth of the expertise and the bodies of literature that are involved in compiling this glossary. Uh, next, I'd like to walk you through the uh, process through which uh, the glossary was put uh, together. We had some initial terms to get us oriented and to get us started. But after that, as uh, during the sprints, which were during the expert discussions, uh, a lot of terms uh, during the discussions, there was put a spotlight on some terms that needed a clarification. And there was, that happened during the discussion of specific topics. And during these discussions, topic assistants and rapporteurs were always present and were taking notes. So that when it, when in, when it came time to do the edits to the glossary, uh, either some participants could input their edits directly into the glossary after after approval or after a discussion, or uh, we input the edits directly based on the, the, the expert discussion that was going on. Now, one thing that this picture doesn't actually get right, is, right, uh, is that after the time to edit, we have the glossary in its current form, but it wasn't such a linear process like this uh, slide seems to suggest. We actually uh, took advantage of multiple sprints, multiple discussions uh, over different days in the two weeks uh, that the conference happened to go back and forth between the third and the, and the second step. So editing, then going back to make sure that we were actually capturing in the glossary the discussion of the experts. Uh, next, let me give you a more concrete example of this. So we started with a word literacy and we figured at the beginning, you know, perhaps we can include the different meanings of this term only in under one, one term with different meanings. Uh, it was clear uh, very soon that this was not the case because the word ballooned and exploded into different terms like media literacy, health literacy, digital information literacy. And that was the beginning. Then during the conference, participants and experts noticed that those categories weren't nearly enough. We needed to include also critical health and new digital literacy. And these are all new categories that needed to be included in the glossary, which, which they were uh, throughout, throughout uh, the conference. What this highlights is that the glossary is meant to be a living process. It doesn't grow the tree of knowledge and good practices by itself, of course, but it can give a boost and facilitate. Next, I'd like to leave you with this. First of all, the glossary is a starting point. As you'll, you've heard before and you'll hear in the rest of the webinar, the end here is much higher, and this is just a small piece of it. There's a long road ahead, and terminology is often a first step. Two definitions which um, are particularly crucial. One, the definition of infodemic, as their overabundance of information, some accurate and some not, that makes it harder for people to find trustworthy sources and reliable guidance when needed. The effects of an infodemic are compounded during an epidemic or a pandemic, as we are in now, which makes it especially relevant. And also infodemiology, as we've heard before, the discipline are dealing with infodemic management. The next steps and in the future, we expect that the glossary will continue to be a living document and it will be available for public comment and we'll share more details on this as soon as they're defined. Lastly, I'd like to thank all of the contributors and especially uh, Patricia, who's also a co-curator of the glossary at WHO and all of our topic assistant and rapporteurs, including topic masters and coaches, including Margot and Brian, you've heard from before, because they work tirelessly in reporting and collating and connecting and cleaning up the wide ranging discussion that was sometimes uh, going on at three in the morning. Beyond adequate doses of coffee, it was the experts enthusiasm and sparkling insights that kept us focused on the conversation at all times. So thank you to those who participated. Thank you to you who are interested in this. Back to you, Sarah. Thank you very much, uh, Stefano. What an exciting uh, project to be involved in, drawing on all these different disciplines to try and create a, a kind of common platform for which uh, the science can be built. 
Um, we're now going to um, watch two videos uh, from members of the organizing team where the speakers of the videos are going to share um, their experience. Um, Tina, my colleague, is going to uh, play those videos now. Over to you, Tina. Okay, the first one is from Anatoly in um, Canada. Hello, I'm Anatoly Grust, Associate Professor and Canada Research Chair in Privacy Preserving Digital Technologies at Ryerson University in Toronto, Canada. Together with Neil Johnson, I had the privilege of moderating discussions around topic one, where we ask, how can the digital and physical information environment be measured and monitored? We had many fruitful discussions around this topic, but what stood out for me in particular is the fact that before we can even figure out how to manage infodemic, we first need to understand and agree on how do we properly manage user-generated data that come from social media and other sources. This is because the issue of handling social media data and other trace data is multifaceted. It requires a common framework to examine such data through technical, ethical, and policy angles. To help us with this, we can turn to the emerging notion of data stewardship. It used to study data practices of research labs, mostly in hard sciences, but it can also be applied to other types of data, like social media data, because it covers main data management steps, such as collection, storage, analysis, publishing, and reuse of social media data. But unlike data generated in labs by researchers, social media data is generated by users and being curated by social media platforms. So for researchers like ourselves, we have to negotiate policies and expectations from both users and the platforms and consider not just technical, but also ethical issues of handling such data. Here are some key takeaways that emerged from our group discussions on this topic, as well as from some previous research in the area. So social media data stewardship uh, is not a one size fits all framework, in particular because privacy will vary across uses, users and data types. And that even if we work with publicly available social media data, we as researchers still have ethical considerations uh, to examine when using such data. In particular, because for many social media users, there's no difference in their privacy concerns, whether you ask them about private or publicly available social media data. So for further discussions on this topic, I will refer you to Association of Internet Researchers Guides on Ethics. And here are some useful uh, references uh, based on some recent work in this space. Thank you. Great, uh, thank you. And here is also, whoops, just a moment. Thanks, uh, Tina. <laughs> Can be tricky managing all the different. Uh... Uh, yes, uh, apologies uh, for this uh, lap. So um, I will now switch over to uh, two other topic masters, two facilitators of another topic discussion. Um, I'm just setting up the video now and um, we'll start sharing the screen. So, hello everybody, my name is Sara Rubinelli. I'm a professor of health communication at the University of Luzern in Switzerland, and I was uh, co-chair uh, of uh, topic four about uh, how to manage an intervention, uh, uh, yeah, to manage um, infodemics. It was the first time that I did uh, a conference in this format, and I, from my perspective, it worked really smoothly because uh, we had a very enriching discussion, everything 
everything was uh, very well organized and structured. And the, I really appreciated the multidisciplinarity and the passion that everybody had in, uh, in dealing and discussing this topic. So I'm very happy because in the end we came out with a very good recommendation that can read really base uh, infodemic as a science. So in my view, it was perfect. And I really, I mean, hope that uh, we can continue working on this because it's a very exciting topic and a very exciting approach. And I would like to thank uh, WHO for making all this possible. Um, hi, I'm Emily Braga. I'm at the University of Minnesota in the United States. And I want to agree with everything Sarah said. It was such an invigorating experience um, meeting so many people from so many different perspectives. I thought that was really the strength of the conference that we got to talk to people from a lot of different fields all over the world who could offer the unique perspectives on how to manage this infodemic. Um, we have some really fascinating insights and I'm excited to see what happens next. So thanks to the World Health Organization, this was a lot of fun and I hope we get to do it again. Thanks very much, Tina, for sharing those videos. And we're actually going to go now to um, Emily Live, who's joined us as um, a panelist. As you heard, Emily is an associate professor at the Hubbard School of Journalism and Mass Communication at the University of Minnesota. And uh, Emily was also part of the conference organizing team as one of the scientific facilitators. So Emily, very happy to have you over, over to you now. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm here to represent the Topic Masters, and you just heard from me, so I'm not going to repeat a lot of what I said. Um, but I do want to say that one of the things that I thought was a real strength of the conference is the opportunity to work with so many different groups. So you've heard a little bit about how that conference was organized, and it meant that each week we had these different um, groups coming in to talk about questions uh, that were meant to be focused in a particular domain. So Sarah and I were in charge of interventions, thinking about different correction strategies that could be employed to dealing with the infodemic for COVID-19 especially, but also laying a groundwork for any future health crises where we would need this kind of um, rigorous intervention. And so what was really exciting was that each group was focused on our conversation, but it was also a continuation of the conversations the groups had been having because they were working together throughout these different sprints. So we would get to enter into a conversation among a group of researchers and try and shift it a little bit to be talking about um, interventions specifically, but also really gleaning from their insights. Um, and so even though it was the same topic, the first sprint and the last one looked really different because we would build on what we already knew. We would bring the insights from the previous groups into the last one and help us really refine some of the knowledge that we were already building. So I wanted to highlight a few of the key takeaways from our perspective. Um, I think they will differ a little bit depending on which talk, topic master you speak with. Um, but the biggest ones are first just that interdisciplinarity. You heard from the, the glossary team there are so many insights we can borrow from a lot of different fields, um, health communication, risk communication, actual public health, uh, social network analysis. And so far we each have our own vocabulary. So encouraging us to find ways to speak to other people in other fields, figuring out where those connections are, where we didn't necessarily see them. And then finally testing and doing research to see which lessons apply to infodemiology and which don't. Um, some, some health recommendations might really translate easily. Some of the terms that we use for epidemics might apply to infodemics, some won't. So that's a, an exciting area where we all are committed to doing more research. I would say that a great example of that, and you already heard, is the idea of literacy, which came up in every single sprint that we did. Um, that literacy might be a way to help us build resilience so that people themselves are empowered to recognize what is good information and what is bad information. Um, there's a lot of research on a bunch of different ways of defining literacy, all of which has some promise, but all of which also has a bunch of limitations where they haven't necessarily applied them to this topic. Um, so that's a space where getting all of these people from different fields in the same space really helped build that that groundwork that will allow us to test literacy against uh, infodemics. 
Likewise, thinking about the personas that one of the participants mentioned, thinking about who the vulnerable audiences are and whether we're talking about vulnerability in terms of disease versus in terms of information consumption versus in terms of information spread is going to be really important. The other kind of ways to think about it are in terms of what are the actual in interventions that we need. And so we decided that as a team, what we need is a living systematic review, a place where all of us can look and see what is the misinformation that is spreading? What are the characteristics that are going to make misinformation spread particularly problematic? And then what are the interventions that we know are likely to be successful against those types of misinformation? Again, there's so much great research being done, even more than I was aware of. Um, and so finding a place where all of us can speak to each other more quickly, more readily, where we're building on each other's work rather than working in silos is I think the, the promise that this conference really represents to all of us. And so I think it was a fantastic experience and one that I hope can continue with the, the foundation that we've laid in the past two weeks um, to inform all of our decisions and reinforce the connections that we made over the past few weeks. Thank you very much, um, Emily. Very happy to hear your experiences and also the desire to continue this uh, work and collaboration um, that's ongoing ar around the world. Um, I'm going to now uh, pass to Pierre Luigi Sacco. Uh, Pierre is a professor of cultural economics at the IU IULM University of uh, Milan. He is also a senior advisor and faculty associate at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University. Um, Pierre was a participant at the conference and is going to comment on his experience. Pierre, welcome um, to the webinar. Thank you very much. It's been a really a wonderful experience to participate in this webinar. And um, I would say that uh, most of us, as Emily, by the way, was a marketing just before, uh, most of us have experiences of disciplinary conferences, where of course you have a very exciting meetings with uh, very competent colleagues, but at the same time, in some sense, you're all on the same boat and you know exactly where this boat is going more or less. But here, you have a completely different kind of experience. This was about connecting a very diverse community from the point of view of the disciplinary backgrounds of people who were very different, the competencies that uh, despite uh, the difference in background, there was a yet a further level of difference in the specific competence and interests, and of course the geographical variety of the, of the, of the group. So this was uh, really refreshing and uh, gave, uh, I think, to all participants uh, an incredible opportunity to understand in this moment what is the pulse of the different sensitivities, the different views on such a complex problem like infodemics. Um, what if I should uh, summarize briefly in one sentence, what was the purpose in the end of this exercise was probably establishing a forum for collective intelligence. It's really something about uh, not simply just bringing together many reasoning people, but creating a new layer of reason that was uh, really, in some sense, uh, getting out the best of the single disciplinary perspectives. And this, of course, uh, was difficult. And clearly, we are just uh, at the beginning of the journey. So first of all, well, it was about finding and co-building a transdisciplinary space to frame infodemics. Because clearly, I mean, there are so many angles from which you can take it. So how do we establish a common space for this. So this was clearly the first step. And I think that uh, throughout, I mean, I of course had a different ex experience from Emily because I stayed in the same group from, for all the four stages. But what I saw, for example, was that this was this gradual building of this common space. And more and more confidently, we were able to interact with each other, knowing each other in ways that would really enable a different level of reflection. A second aspect is of course, uh, Trans, uh, translating and in some sense going beyond the disciplinary languages and mentalities. Because of course, in a situation like this, everybody comes with, with our vocabulary. Everybody comes with a frame of mind that is shaped by their own discipline. And it was very important and meaningful and difficult to establish more and more a common language. And in this sense, of course, what the glossary did was amazing. Uh, and I think, again, this is just the beginning. We can really do a lot starting from this glossary. 
And then, of course, the problem has been, and still is, the difficulty in achieving a synthesis. Could I say that now I have a clear idea how to take all infodemics after this webinar? Of course not. Uh, I understood how difficult it is to achieve a synthesis. But at the same time, I also saw very concrete possible steps to arrive there, and especially how useful the plugging into different disciplinary frameworks can be from this point of view. So I think that uh, the common feeling that emerged from this interaction uh, is, and it was just repeated also, by the way, at the end uh, of, the, uh, of the session, the final session by all participants, was uh, the clear understanding of the value added of working together in this way. So I think that what the WHO did with this is already a milestone in its own right. The fact of creating an environment for such a level of global collaboration on an issue is a, a, an, 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 an endeavor in itself. But more concretely, what did, uh, what we, did we get in terms of takeaways? Uh, so uh, infodemic, I think that uh, one thing that is clear and uh, I, I think it's also important to stress this further, is that there are uh, several different viewpoints that are crucial to understand infodemic. There is a computational viewpoint. Of course, big data from this point of view are of crucial importance. And our uh, ability to tap into this incredible flow of information is uh, probably going to make the difference because uh, this means in particular being uh, able to react in real time. It's almost impossible to have an uh, evidence-based intervention through sources other than, uh, for example, social media and online content that really